grand piano, David Merrick's desk, and this couch. Good evening, David. Good evening. How long have you been in this office? Uh, about ten years. Do you really control all your Broadway shows from just this little nucleus here? Yes. How large a uh, permanent staff have you got? How many people working for you? Not very many, about uh, eight. Mm -hmm. But you do run quite an operation. About what is the gross income per year? Uh, it runs currently 20 to 25 million dollars. How many shows have you got on Broadway now, David? I have six running on Broadway now. Who's the best actor you've ever had working for you? Uh, Laurence Olivier. And the second best? Uh, well, that's hard to say. There, there's a whole group of very fine actors after that. I think the second best actor in the world after Laurence Olivier is uh, Paul Schofield. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest draw you've ever had at the box office? What show? Before or after the opening? The biggest draw I've had after the opening was Hello, Dolly! was and still is. Mm -hmm. And what about behind Hello, Dolly? What was second? Oh, I've had quite a number of musicals uh, after that. Uh, Cactus Flower, a straight play, is still currently very strong. And there was Gypsy and Carnival and many others quite strong. Is there any name in, in show business, anyone that you're familiar with or who you've worked with, that can guarantee you an automatic hit if they play the lead? Uh, there are very few. Uh, I would think some of the regular stars of the past, Mary Martin still would bring in a huge advance. Ethel Merman, uh, at the time she appeared in Gypsy, brought in a big advance sale. That would guarantee at least getting your money back, not necessarily a hit, but a run. That's about as much as you can expect. But there are very few who would guarantee a hit. Do you think that those two still would? I think so, and there are several others like that. And occasionally, uh, one of the motion picture people might uh, bring in a big hit if they were to appear in a play, but they won't. Who's the best actress you ever had working for you? That I couldn't say. There have been several, and they're so close together, I wouldn't pick one. Well, they're, the top group. There are greater... Uh, actors in the world today than there are actresses, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Well, can you give us the, uh, the top five without putting them in any particular order? You must have some preference, uh, having put them through these shows. Well, no, I can run through, oh, Anne Bancroft's and uh, Ingrid Bergman and quite a number of them who work in the theater. There are quite a number of fine actresses in films, but I don't work in films. Yes. You have a lot of business contact with these people. Do you ever enjoy their company socially? Uh, which category? You mean the, the uh, performers? Yes. Well, I usually avoid socialization with actors. I think it's best in order to, uh, to keep a proper authority in my work to stay away from the actors. Sort of on the old theory that the captain stays alone? I think so. It well, works best that way. What's your opinion of actors as people, David? Well, there's a line in a play I have running now called the, the title of the play is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead, and one of the characters in it is an actor. He's the chief actor of the troupe within the play. And his comment about himself and actors is that actors are the opposite of people. Uh, by the very nature of their work, they uh, have a nar narcissus complex, an enormous one, considerable egomania, and sadly they're constantly in fear. They're in fear each day that they're one day older. Uh, and I think they must be that way. On the other side, they're rather charming, and they're like children. They're all about ten years old, in my opinion. Do you regard them as artists? Yes, they're artists in a way. Uh, I think I would call them interpretive artists. That is, uh, that is, as against the creative artist. The creative artist is the man who writes the play, or composes it, or directs it. 
in the secondary category of the creative artists. So I call them interpretive artists, and that's way down the line for me. They're not ad-libbing those lines. No, that's certainly true. But do you think it's possible for someone to be a good actor without being an egomaniac and without being a frightened, spoiled, ten-year-old child? No, I think they must be that in part, at least. I think that's... Uh, whatever propels them into wanting to be an actor in the first place has all of that with it. Uh, why do they want to perform? They want to appear before audiences and receive all that adulation and that applause that comes from the audience, and that itself would stamp them. I think it would stamp them as rather shallow. Do they resent the fact that you don't fraternize with them or have much to do with them on the outside? Not at all. They don't believe it. I've heard that 20 to 25 percent of all working Broadway is working for you. Is that right? Mm, about, yes. It's sometimes said, David, that critics can make or break a Broadway show. Do you believe that? I certainly do. They have made and broken them for me many times. Do you think that they make as many as they break with their criticism? No, no. They break many more than they make because there are fewer good things for them to write about than bad things. I must admit that most of our efforts uh, in the normal course of events are not that good. Truman Capote told me a week ago that there were virtually no good literary critics. What do you say about dramatic critics? Are there any around that you would term good? Oh, yes, there are some. I'd rather not main them. We have some very good drama critics. I choose to fight with them and protect my baby, and uh, I don't think they mind that. You uh, wouldn't care to name for me your opinion of the worst and the best, would you? No, I think that would be uh, wrong because there are so many terrible ones. I would be, uh, I would be sort of uh, leaving out too many. That wouldn't be good. You once, uh, as I recall, canceled a preview and bought back a thousand tickets just to prevent the Times critic Stanley Kaufman from getting a view of the show. Is that right? Yes, that fellow uh, really was rather an amateur at his profession and he couldn't write in the short space of time allotted on an opening night and his deadline, so he started attending previews. Well, I wouldn't have any part of that. The preview was not the opening night. We aim everything in the theater for the first night, you know. And uh, he was wandering in at the wrong time. So he came to one of my previews and found we weren't playing that night. And that about did him in because he had to cover the play the next night and that rather showed him up, because being forced to write the review in one hour, he couldn't write it. It turned out he was, uh, well, he didn't have gifts in that direction. I suggested at the time that he should seek vocational guidance, and I think he has since gone into something else. I think he's teaching now. I see. I think that his career as a critic perhaps terminated because he couldn't sample any more of David Merrick's preview. Well, that helped. David, what do you think of the current crop of TV critics? Uh, uh, their abilities are, uh, well, their abilities well, let's go into two areas. Uh, television critics have become very important as the number of newspapers has constantly disappeared in New York. We're down to only three. Just uh, very few years ago, we had eight. Uh, the television critics have taken on importance. The circulation of the New York dailies runs maybe three and a half million, and the circulation of just the three network critics and they, uh, they cover plays only locally, would be many millions. Uh, what I resent about them is that they are only allotted uh, by their editors one minute to cover the play. Well, after our considerable efforts of working a year or longer on a production, I think that's uh, not a very respectable time to cover it. That you can, If you consider some plays with long titles, suppose it had been how to succeed in business without really trying playing at the so-and-so theater and with a cast of the following and you're virtually out of the minute and then he's left with a single word to say that it's either good, medium, or terrible and that's not enough. Frequently I find in, uh, and I'm sure readers uh, out there would admit that they read a review and they find in the content of the review something that would interest them. Who's in it, uh, the subject matter in particular, the look of it, uh, the story, some stories critics are brave about and the public want no part of. I've had that experience. 
other stories that the critics are not too happy about, uh, the public would find very interesting and popular. Therefore, I think we need much more time, and I've tried to prevail upon the networks to give more time, but they say no, it's um, as part of a news broadcast. Hmm. From time to time, you have a feud going with one critic or the other. Have you got any running right at the moment? No, I've been very fortunate with them so far, but uh, I rearrange my prejudices every couple of weeks. <laughs> David, how much influence do you think critics really have on the audience's reaction? In other words, if a critic says, this play is hilarious. Does the audience go conditioned to laugh? Is it easy to put it over? Uh, the audience doesn't go conditioned to do anything. Uh, I've had some uh, shows playing previews uh, where the audience absolutely hated the show. Uh, I had a week of previews on a musical called La Plume de Matante, for example. And they actually walked out in droves at the end of the evening, starting with a full house, I'd wind up with about a 10% of the audience. Now, first night came along, and they weren't too happy about it even then. It was a cold first night. But the critics said it was the funniest thing they'd ever seen. It was a unanimous ecstatic press. And from the second night forward, for about two and a half years in New York, and much longer on tour, they laughed hilariously at it. And they laughed in Omaha, and they laughed in Kansas City, and all over the country when it toured. I find that after uh, critics say that a play is funny, you watch the audience, and they arrive, and just when the lights start dimming, they start smiling, and start, they start, <laughs> in short, they start laughing because they've been told to laugh. And that's really my battle. It's not with the critics. It's trying to tell the public to not pay too much attention to that. I dislike the notion of that consumer's research report. You know, the toaster is good or isn't good. Make up their own minds. What does this tell you about theater audiences if they are so easily led down the path to acceptance? Well, audiences any place, uh, they can be influenced, unfortunately and the press does influence public opinion in every direction. David, how did you get started in Broadway productions? It seems to me you uh, were once a lawyer or practiced as a lawyer. Well, I once